Shalom Kulam Makore. You may remember in my video correcting my first nine videos, I said I wanted to remake my Hebrew language overview. That's what this is. I'll be remaking the Hebrew language overview from a few years ago here, both in terms of correcting the stuff I got wrong in that video, as well as updating it to my modern style of language overviews. My next video will come out in just a few days, as I've been working on these two side by side. Let's go! First, the origin story, Hebrew or Ivrit, is a central Semitic language in the Afroasiatic language family. Within the central Semitic languages, Hebrew is a northwest Semitic language after Arabic split off, and is also a Canaanite language, which is basically all of that lower branch except Aramaic and Ugaritic. Therefore, the Hebrew slash Israelites slash Jews are one of the Canaanite groups, and the split off occurred probably sometime between 2000 and 1500 BC, distinguishing the language we now know as Biblical Hebrew. There's a lot of history here, but basically Egypt took over for a while, then they left, then there may have been a united kingdom of Israel, then there definitely were two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. This was before 720 BC when the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, leaving the kingdom of Judah and creating refugees. In 587 BC, the Babylonians destroyed the kingdom of Judah and took all the Jews they could to Babylon, modern Iraq, as slaves. This lasted for 48 years because in 539 BC, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, led by Cyrus the Great, took over Babylon and sent the Jews back to Israel. This period had linguistic consequences, though, as Hebrew began gradually dying out as a native language in favor of the regional lingua franca, Aramaic, over the next 700 years or so. In these 700 years, there was the Persian Empire, as mentioned, followed by Alexander the Great's Hellenic League, the split of which gave Israel to Ptolemaic Egypt, and then the Seleucid Empire, still Greek, followed by a brief 103 years of independence in the Hasmonean Dynasty before Israel, or Judea, became a Roman puppet state, and then later it just became part of the Roman Empire. In 70 AD, in the First Jewish-Roman War, after the Siege of Jerusalem, the Romans took the Jews there to Rome as slaves. In 135 AD, after the failed Bar Kokhba revolt in the Siege of Betar, the Romans banned Jews from Jerusalem at all and created a lot of refugees. Hebrew is now dead as a native language, but continued to be used as a liturgic language by all the Jewish communities over the next 1700 years and evolved as such, while the Jews spoke Jewish dialects of the local language where they were for daily matters. And this time, Israel is ruled by this depressing timeline of imperial powers. In the 1800s, the modern wave of Zionism got underway and a lot of Jews moved to modern-day Israel, then under rule of the Ottoman Empire. The one language that all the Jews had in common was their religious language, Hebrew. Hebrew was more or less established as the lingua franca of Israel, but its revival as a native language was largely organized by this guy, Elizer Ben Yudah. As a lexicographer and profound advocate for the revival of Hebrew, Ben Yudah noticed that Hebrew as they knew it lacked many words needed to discuss modern concepts, so he coined words using existing Hebrew roots, most of which cut on, some of which didn't, but where he gets the most credit is that he raised his son, Ben Sion, as the first native speaker of modern Hebrew. Grammatical changes that took place to form modern Hebrew are mostly the result of popular demand among Israelis. Today, Hebrew is the main language of Israel, where it's spoken by over 7 million native speakers, around 2 million people speak it as a second language, and it remains the liturgical language of Judaism in its biblical form. It's also the only language to ever be revived. Now for how Hebrew sounds. Hebrew has 6 vowels and 20 consonants, totaling 26 phonemes. In terms of interesting Hebrew sounds, there's the famous one that everyone knows, the voiceless uvular fricative ch, but there's also the less famous voice uvular approximate re, although it should be mentioned that some people pronounce this as a rolled r instead. As far as allophones, they're all included in the phoneme count and due to the nature of Hebrew, which we'll talk about a bit later in the orthography and grammar sections, Hebrew allophones are hard to define. But basically, there used to be allophone experientization of the plosives, meaning that they became fricatives, namely at the ends of words, at the ends of most syllables, and in intervocalic positions when they weren't geminated, while staying plosives elsewhere. However, modern Hebrew has lost gemination, meaning that we can no longer call spirantization allophonic since it has now become a distinguishing feature between certain words in that position. The pairs that remain around, namely beve, keche, and befe, still behave mostly allophonically according to the rules I described, though. That brings us to the script. Remember how in my first video I was complaining about how the script English uses doesn't fit the actual language well? Well, there's nothing to worry about here because the Hebrew script fits the language almost perfectly. But first, I need to make something clear. The language is written right to left, the opposite of English. I see some of y'all switching the directions in which y'all have been studying the subtitles. Now that we're past that, the Hebrew script is an abjad with 22 letters. An abjad is a writing system with only consonants, mostly, but more on that later. The system works for Hebrew and Semitic languages overall, as the morphology of these languages conveys the meaning of the word through a root of three or four consonants, called the shulish, while the grammar is carried by the vowels in the word and sometimes some other consonants, known as the pattern or binyan. This means that you don't need all the vowels to be able to read a word if you know the context of the sentence and, of course, Hebrew grammar. About the letters now, officially vav makes the v sound and yud makes the y sound, but more often than not these days, vav represents either the o or u sound, like in avoda or chamud, and yud makes the e sound, like in amitz. In fact, to indicate a consonant representation, those letters are duplicated, such as in mizvada and liatzig. Side note, while it's easy to see how a letter representing ye could represent e as well, a letter with a face value of v representing o and 
and Ul is harder to understand. Here's how that happens. When evolving recently, Hebrew underwent a wet to the consonant shift, but the speakers continued using their letter affected by the sound shift to represent those two vowels. This can be seen in Arabic, a central Semitic language that didn't undergo this consonant shift, which uses its equivalent letter wow to represent wa and u. The letter that represents wa, u, and ul is easier to understand, but basically that's how it happens. These three letters, bet, gaf, and pe, are the ones affected by the spiritization that I mentioned in the last section. For example, the word for open in adjective form is patuach, but in infinitive verb form it's pronounced liftuach. The three-letter root didn't change, therefore neither did the overall meaning, so it'd be confusing to change the letter for that phoneme. This is one of the best examples for how the Hebrew script complements the spoken language so well. On another note, the letter sheen can be said either sh or s. There's no way to tell the difference except memorization, and one would be misunderstood if they used the wrong fricative. If there's any flaw in the Hebrew writing system, it's this one letter that should have one sound and give all occurrences of s the samich. Back to the words patuach and liftuach, and notice the smooth vowel transition on the last syllable of each word. The same thing happens in words like lish and shomea. In certain situations, chet and ayn change the vowels surrounding them to a. Using liftuach and lishmoa as examples, another way these letters affect their surrounding vowels is in the feminine singular present tense conjugations, botachet and shomat. Along with this, a basic noun structure is such as getev or seder. With chet at the end, the last vowel becomes a, as in melach. And with chet in the middle, both vowels become a, as in lachat, except that lechem is the exception. Remember that ayn does all the same things that chet does, and that can be found in teka and rash. By the way, some speakers actually pronounce chet as ch rather than ch. All those antics aside, the hardest concept of the subject to wrap one's head around is the fact that Aleph represents an imaginary consonant that Hebrew speakers just sort of agree exists. There's not even a hard pharyngeal stop or vowel changing power like Ein has, it's just there and audible. To demonstrate, some words with Aleph are emet kev deshe le roz limtso and ibud. Because of the consonant root structure of Semitic languages, most words that seem like they start with a vowel actually have an inaudible consonant there, alif being what represents it. Some letters can physically change form as well. Five Hebrew letters change visually to a form, typically with a tail, that they only take when they're the last letter in a word in order to be more aesthetically pleasing. This is called the sofit, or ending form. Now for some Hebrew grammar, starting with a sentence structure. While Biblical Hebrew was VSO, modern Hebrew is SVO in both question and statement form. Typically, the object order is indirect object, then direct object, then any other descriptors needed to add detail to the sentence. Example sentence, This means the waiter will bring us dinner in five minutes. In dissecting the sentence, we find that it's article attached to subject, verb conjugated for he, future tense, indirect object, literally to us, direct object, rest of sentence slash predicate. All numbers go before the noun they modify, except for some reason, one, or a chat. This is unlike adjectives, which always go after their nouns. The other main sentence structure thing is that supplemental nouns go after the main noun. Also, Hebrew is pro-drop for subject pronouns, except for in present tense. As seen in the example sentence, Hebrew has one article, the definite article ha. It's attached to the beginnings of definite nouns and their attributive adjectives. In constructive noun phrases, the article only goes on the absolutive noun, but we'll talk more about that in the next section. Now about the nouns. Hebrew nouns are split into two genders, masculine and feminine, and two numbers, singular and plural, although it should be mentioned that Hebrew maintains traces of the dual number its ancestors used to have. Specifically, words related to periods of time still get inflected for dual, like shatayim, yomayim, shvuayim, chodshayim, shnatayim, and pamayim, and the dual is now the designated plural form for certain nouns that tend to come in pairs, like enaim, oznaim, yadaim, svataim, nalaim, raglaim, and for some reason, shinaim, even though last they check, teeth typically come in groups a bit larger than two. In the singular, feminine nouns can be identified by ending with tav or he, like rakevet and sira. All other nouns tend to be masculine. However, there are quite a few exceptions in which words not ending with tav or he are feminine, and words ending in those two letters are masculine. For example, the words rach, shemesh, and ir look masculine but are feminine, and the words bait, delet, and laila look feminine but are masculine. It gets crazier when we talk about plural suffixes though. In the plural, masculine nouns end with im and feminine nouns with ot. The masculine suffix just goes on the end of the word like in chag to chagim, kelev to klavim, and karish to krishim. Adding the feminine plural suffix is a bit more complicated. When it ends in he with the a sound, the he is dropped before adding ot, as in dirat dirot. When the singular ends with tav, the vav simply inserts itself before the tav, as in miklachat to miklachot and karit to kariot, unless the word ends with ut, in which case yot is placed after the vav, as in chanot to chanoyot. Here's where it gets interesting. Some words take the plural suffix of the other gender. For example, shana pluralizes to shanim and milat milim, while ol pluralizes to rot and av to avot. As for cases, Hebrew is not a case language overall, but it does have one case that can't be forgotten, the constructive case. The constructive case is basically kind of an inverse genitive in that when there's a phrase with two nouns, a main one and a supplementary one, the main noun, which goes first in Hebrew, gets modified sometimes, and the supplementary noun, which goes second, remains unchanged. If the situation requires the definite article, it only goes on the supplementary noun. As we're out of form the constructive case, feminine nouns ending with he change to tav, like in dinatem dinat, as in dinat Israel. 
The masculine plural suffix im becomes e, such as in toshavim ta toshve or milim ta mile, because the actual gender of the word is irrelevant here. Regardless if one of the aforementioned changes affects a word, many bisyllabic words with a in the first syllable and the stress in the second drop the a from the first syllable when forming the constructive, like in tzavat ta tzva and safat ta sfat. Remember, Tzava ends with an alef, so it doesn't get the tav like safa. Most other nouns don't change in the constructive case, while there are a few that have their own unique constructive forms like lev televav. Finally, in cases, while it's no longer productive, there are still traces of the biblical Hebrew alative case made by attaching a to the end of the noun found on the ends of certain direction words to clarify that they are directions or destinations, rather than just places. That's all for nouns. Now it's time for some pronouns. The notable thing about Hebrew pronouns is that all second and third person pronouns are gendered. This includes the words for it not included on the chart, but here they are, ze for masculine and zo or zot for feminine. They pluralize the ere and elu respectively. These are also demonstratives, by the way. Modern Hebrew doesn't really differentiate between near and far demonstratives, so this is just the general set of demonstratives. Now for the object pronouns, which may get a little complicated. For any pronominal situation that isn't subject, Hebrew pronouns take the form of a suffix on a preposition. This includes direct objects. Hebrew has a direct object preposition, et, which transforms into these forms when suffixed. With non-pronouns, by the way, et is only used when the direct object is definite. These suffixes have two main forms, the singular and the plural, and which one is used depends on the preposition. They're called these after the now largely obsolete system in which these suffixes got added to nouns to indicate possession, these for singular nouns, and these for plural nouns. Nowadays, possession is indicated by the preposition shel. Now I'll talk about Hebrew numbers, and they're pretty interesting. As mentioned in the sentence structure portion of the video, numbers differ from adjectives in that they precede their noun with the exception of one, echad rachat, which goes after. The gendered morphology of numbers is also peculiar. To start, the number two is shnaim in masculine and shtaim in feminine, but that's only if you're counting or otherwise saying the number on its own. If it's in a noun phrase, then it's always either shne or shte, but not as the ones placed in a multi-digit number. 22 is still eslim v'shtaim. Above that, the numbers 3 through 19 have gendered forms, but they work in the opposite way that nouns and adjectives do. As in, the form ending with he is the masculine. In addition, the masculine numbers 3, 4, 5, 6, and 10 have constructive forms that you have to use when the noun is definite, as in, the five books. But they don't behave like constructive nouns. Instead, their constructive forms look like feminine nouns with penultimate stress, being shloshet, arbat, chameshet, sheshet, and aseret. On the other hand, 7, 8, and 9 have constructive masculine forms that behave like normal feminine nouns, being shivat, shmonat, and tishat. Other numbers don't have unique constructive forms. In fact, the tens places 20 and above aren't gendered, although the ones places remain gendered. Nouns being modified by numbers larger than 1 are still pluralized, unless they're a unit of currency. Now about ordinal numbers, they behave just like normal adjectives coming after their noun, and here are the ordinal numbers 1st through 10th. Now for adjectives. Adjectives agree with the noun in both gender and number, and as previously mentioned, they always come after the noun. Hebrew doesn't distinguish between adjectives and adverbs, although if you really want, you can say both in and then the adjective in masculine singular form, which means in a blank manner. Adjectives look a lot like nouns in terms of inflections, as the masculine singular form doesn't have a special ending, the feminine singular form adds either a or it, the masculine plural form adds im, and the feminine plural form adds ot. For adjectives that add a in feminine singular, there's two letter adjectives like ken, honest, and adjectives with two letters followed by he, such as ge, proud. Notice that only pronunciation in the two singular forms changes, the spelling stays the same. Then there's the adjectives with three letters and nothing else, like sameach, happy, remember the power of chet, and ashem, guilty. Due to the differences in the fluidity of their first letters, the agreements come out differently. Also ending his feminine singular form with he are the participles, or passive forms, of verbs in class 1. What that means I'll explain later, but what you'll need to know now is that an example of the passive form of these verbs is chamud, cute, which agrees like this. There are other types of adjectives that agree in feminine singular with a, but when someone gets really into Hebrew, it'll all fall into place. For the feminine singular adjectives with the et ending, the big type of adjectives for this one are those ending with e. This includes pretty much every demonym there is, along with some other words. For example, we have the demonym Yisraeli, Israeli, which agrees like this. Then we get to the passive forms of class 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 verbs, represented by mushlam, perfect, and mevushal, cooked. Then there's the adjectives, such as glis, angry, and glish, loud, whose feminine forms end with tet, but they are actually verbs conjugated in the present tense. Which leads us right into... Verbs. The verbs are where we get to see the three-letter root system really in action. With three and four-letter roots, there are seven verb classes that they could fall into, although there may be an eighth for two-letter roots. To get that out of the way, the two-letter roots are actually just three-letter roots, but the middle letter is either vav or yud, so they disappear in many places. Examples are lazuz and lashir. I'll count those as I would if they had three shalashim. Words that appear to have two shalashim could also happen in certain forms where the final two shalashim are the same. 
Back to the verb classes, now I'll list them giving their infinitive forms, although dictionaries list their third person masculine singular past tense forms, but I'll get back to that. Last one is just a general class, and all the two letter verbs that I've used as examples so far technically belong to it. For three letter roots in class one, there's l'iscol. Class two is semantically similar to class one, but looks a bit different, so we have le dabel. Four letter roots can also belong here, like le shachna. We won't look too much of those though, as they behave exactly like the verbs with li shalashim. Now for class three, which is peculiar, as it can only happen in verbs where the last two shalashim are the same, such as le savev. On a class that have semantic meaning in themselves now, class 4 is the causative of class 1, meaning that the subject of the sentence with the verb in it causes the object to do the verb in the root. Remember l'isco from the first verbal binyan? It means remember, and if you put the root in class 4, it'll be l'azkir, meaning remind. Then, class 5 is the reflexive of class 2, meaning that the subject is basically doing the verb to itself. So whereas le fateach means develop something else, lit pateach means develop yourself. Also important to mention, the tav in the binyan undergoes metathesis when the first shulish is a coronal, fricative, or affricate, meaning one of the these letters explaining why I have le chagea in class 2, but le chagea in class 5. It may also change in this case for assimilation, as if that letter is zain, then the tav will change to dalet, like in lizdaken, and if that letter is tzadi, then the tav will change to tet, like in lizdaref. Pause to read if you're curious as to why. Class 6 is also reflexive, but for class 3, and the rule about the shoish still applies along with the metathesis from class 5, which is how we get litzpotzet and listoviv. However, not all class 6 verbs have their transitive forms in class 3. Some combine their identical second and third shoashim and join class 4, like litkonen and lachin. Finally, class 7, for example, li shavea, looks a bit like class 5, but behaves very differently. It's a bit of a soft reflexive, or just a straight up reflexive in some cases. So, that's all the verb classes, but there are extra complications with verbs. Remember the verbs that look like they have two shalashim, like lazuz? That's an example of a disappearing radical, which has a specific system for happening on each shalish. That one is on a second shalish. I'll now explain the others. If the third shalish is alternatively he or tav, then that's a disappearing radical. Most of the time, if an infinitive verb ends with ot, that's what you're seeing. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, this means that if you're looking at a class 1 and class 2 example in the infinitive, you can't tell them apart by reading. Take the homographic examples of litzpot and letzapot. The vowels clearly indicate that litzpot is class 1 and letzapot is class 2, but those won't be written. They can also occur in other classes like class 5 having litkashot. A notable exception to this whole thing is linchot, which behaves like a normal class 1 verb. As for disappearing radicals on the first sholish, those are very confusing, but for example, there's la lechet and la dat. You can't actually see their first sholashim in the infinitive, and the tav isn't part of the root. These are the roots, and outside the infinitive in future tense, they're just normal class 1 verbs. The first shalish is historically based and is unpredictable, but generally it'll be one of these letters. Now we can finally talk about verb conjugations. As doing so is a bit complicated, I'll use a variety of different verbs to try and hit the main points. Those verbs will be Lizkor, Liftoach, Lirtzot, Lalechet, Ladat, Lazuz, Ledaber, Lenasot, Lesovev, Lazkir, Litmaked, Lishtagea, Ligamer, and Lishavea. First up is the present tense, describing things happening now or routinely. As hinted to at the end of the adjective section, this is the chart for the present tense verbs. It has the same forms as the adjectives do, as this tense was innovated out of the agentive form in modern Hebrew, and this is why subject pronouns are generally not dropped in the present tense. For verbs like liskol, there's a simple vowel replacement. Notice how its feminine singular form ends with et, this is something to pay attention to. Here's liftoach, which is only being used to exemplify how the chet and ein vowel shifts work in verbs. For the disappearing final radical, here's liftot, and notice that its feminine singular form ends with a, this is the other possible way. For the disappearing first radicals, here's la lechet and la dat. Notice how they look exactly like normal class 1 verbs in the present tense. Now here's la zuz. On to a different class, here's le daber, which starts its present tense form with mem, a pattern you will see again. Now here's la nasot, still in class 2. Class 3 behaves largely the same way. Class 4 also follows the mem pattern, but the feminine singular ending is with a. With class 5, we're back to the previous pattern. Class 7 is completely different, though. It starts with nun in the present tense, and in fact, is often called the nifad class. Now for the past tense, which is more typical of a verb tense and is notable for only using suffixes. It's organized into this template, but be aware that the u forms are spelled the same, but pronounced differently. Also, the he form in this class only includes the root letters, which is why it's the dictionary form. For verbs like lirzot, the disappearing radical at the end mostly turns into e, but it disappears completely in the third person masculine singular and third person plural forms and reappears as tav in the third person feminine singular form. La lechet and la dat still look like completely normal class 1 verbs here, and now here's la zuz. Class 2 verbs are practically the same except for their vowels. This includes verbs like le with a disappearing final radical. Class 3 retains its own internal vowel structure. Class 4 changes its vowels up a bit, swapping its internal e for a and any forms not in third person. 
Now with itmaked, I'm using it to demonstrate one specific thing. Notice that the second person feminine singular form is itmakadit, not itmakad as the pattern has been so far. This is an epithetic vowel added in this form specifically when the final consonant in the root is either te or de. Now here's the other class 5 verb in past tense. Class 7 verbs in past tense still start with nun. Now we're into the future tense, which is identified by its prefixes other than mem, although there are sometimes also suffixes. Here's the chart for these gul, and you'll notice that the masculine u form and the she form are identical. Just deal with it. Now here's liptoach, and notice the vowel change from o to a. This is caused by the presence of one of these letters around that vowel. For extra information, here's leov in the future. The first vowel becoming o is what happens when the first sholish is aleph. Here it is also with lechol, but for some reason the exception is leroz. Can't figure that one out. Maybe because it's an Aramaic borrowing. It even works when there's a disappearing final radical, like in lefot. Speaking of which, here's lirtzot to show how the future works with other verbs like that. Now Here's la lechet and la dat, which actually don't show their first radical in the future, unlike in the present and in the past. And here's la zuz, which is normal. Knowing all that, classes 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are fairly intuitive, so I'll just quickly flash them across my screen while I say this sentence. Class 7, on the other hand, retains much more of its infinitive form than it does in the other tenses. That's the future tense for you. The second person conjugations in the future are also used for most imperatives, although certain common verbs tend to be used with their older imperative, like la vo becoming bo and la tete becoming ten. Important to note, though, the negative marker for the imperative is al, not lo. So, al tishkacht yom hashana shelano means don't forget our anniversary, but lo tishkacht yom hashana shelano means you won't forget our anniversary. Speaking of la tete, it happens to be one of the four irregulars you need to know that doesn't fit into any aforementioned category. La tete meaning give is weird. It behaves like it should be a disappearing first radical verb like la lechet, which would be la tenet and have nun as the first sholish. Pause to read if you like historical linguistics and you're curious as to why the infinitive is la tete instead. For the other exceptions, luchal meaning can is also weird and takes on these forms. Lichiot meaning live becomes chai in the present tense but is otherwise regular and liot meaning be is just straight up deleted in the present tense but is otherwise regular. It also should be mentioned that for the meaning of need, Tzarich is syntactically a verb, but morphologically an adjective, so it doesn't get conjugated for tense or person, just gender and number. Finally, there's a complicated tandem for the verbs say. The verbs lagid and lomar both mean say, but they're used in different tenses. There's a very strong preference for lagid in the infinitive, future, and imperative. However, you absolutely must use lomar in present and past. Ani magid is not a thing. If the word magid sounds familiar, it's because that's part of the seder where we tell the story. Now, for other stuff you can do with verbs, you can form a composite conditional with the appropriate past tense form of liot and the appropriate present tense form of the main verb, unless you're saying would be, in which case it's just the future. For example, aitiot lishmoalech means I would kill to protect you, male or female. For the nonverbal verb forms, I'll just flash them on the screen. Here are the passive adjective forms, and here are the standard gerunds. The last thing for the verbs is that have doesn't exist in Hebrew. Instead, you'd use yesh, meaning there is, ir for past and future, and then the preposition. Le probably conjugated for the person who has the thing, then the thing being had with it if it's definite. I have a cat in Hebrew is yeshli chatul. Literally, there is a cat to me. The word meaning there is no, by the way, is n, so I don't have a cat is eni chatul. Let's close out the video with some example sentences. First, the sentence says, I didn't have internet on the flight, so it's not like I could have sent you something when I was flying. Female to male. First off, loyali is basically enli in the past tense or I didn't have. Aya also means he was or it was because it's that conjugation of liot. Then there's internet, which I'll let you'll figure out. The prefix bahir means on and tisa means flight. The is mashed in. Azelokilu translates word for word as so it's not like. Kilu is used here because what comes after it is a verb. If it was a noun, the word kmo would be used instead. No relation to Romance languages, that word is a complete coincidence. Yecholti means I could in the past tense. This is one of the irregulars. Lishloach is send in the infinitive. Lecha means to you when speaking to a male. It's formed from the preposition le meaning to and the suffix cha for you masculine. Le is the main indirect object marker in Hebrew. Mashu means something. Et is not used here because mashu is indefinite. And kshetasti means when I was flying or when I flew. Ksha is the conjunction meaning when, and tasti is the I past tense of latus, which means fly on a plane. The other example sentence is, It means, we'll earn our money before them because we're more awesome than them. Niske is the future tense we form of liskot, which means earn. Liskot is a verb that has the prefix be before its object, just because of the Hebrew linguistic perspective. This is known as government. Therefore, there's ba, and the word kesef means money. Shelano means are, and yes, it's after the noun it modifies. Shed is the word for possession, and there's the us suffix anu. Similar thing happens with lefanem, but lifne before has the plural suffixes, so em is used for them. Genachno is because we, and there is no word for are, the copular verb in the present tense is omitted. 
Yoter Madimim means more awesome, but you'll see that Yoter is before the adjective. It's one of the adjective modifiers that can do that. Madim is in masculine plural form. Me means from, but it also means then, and the ending M is added for them. Final thoughts. Asafai Ivrit in Ocha Meod, Ibn Asafot Shani Achiwev, Vken Yeshli Daktoma Bigla Shani Yodi, Avalani Gamma Wev Tasafa Zot Ki Yonitli, Hutmi Kolechai Got Pasumot Shel Smotetem, Lifamim Zem Achisoti, Ani Mosher Shanatatem La Bemeda Likanes Lechem Lamachot, Betodar Abash Tsafitem. Ani Mkave Shagamatem Motim Tasirton Azem Shopar Mir Gersari Shonak, כמו שאני, כי הוא גם יותר מדויק פרופיל מוגזם. לחצו לייק אם תרצו ותצטרפו כדי להיות מעודכנים כשאני מעלה עוד סרטון. להתראות!